looking for when we all get to heaven. Number 633, we'll do all four stanzas. Turn back one page to 632, our opening hymn.
let's bow our heads. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these saddest hours, these precious hours. Thank you so much for the many memories that all of us have here of Atlantic Union College and the way that you have led this school in each of our lives. We thank you now that we can gather together and worship you this evening, and may this be a very special time for all of us. We pray in your loving name. Amen. Good evening. My name is John Sadomar. I'm the president of the Alumni Association. I'd like to welcome everyone home and to the uh, Friday Vespers program. Uh, there is a slight misprint in the bulletin. Uh, as you can see, we have a choir up here as well. This is the collegiate choir led by Dr. Robertson. And uh, we're very blessed to have them with us this evening. They'll be singing two songs, um, and then the program will continue as it is printed. But we wanted to make sure that they had an introduction. You'll note this weekend, uh, you'll see students uh, featured throughout the programs throughout the weekend. And one of the goals of that is that some of us have been away for a while, and it's good to see the excitement the students have and the life they're bringing to the campus and the wonderful things they're doing. And so we're, we're very thrilled to have them here this evening to uh, join us. Uh, tomorrow they go off to uh, New Haven, Connecticut, I believe it is, to uh, continue um, uh, bringing the message of AAUC throughout our conference and our union. So we're very happy that they could uh, take some time out this evening to join us uh, for the program. Uh, also, uh, as you may note, uh, this evening after the Vespers program, we will have, as we've done for the last number of years, downstairs in the fellowship hall, the, uh, um, some refreshments, including uh, Henry Livergood's famous sticky rolls, uh, will be served in the evening. And there's, there's plenty go around for everyone and uh, probably take home a couple as well. Uh, but we hope you'll join us after that for a few moments and, uh, and enjoy a, a light refreshment as well. Uh, so the, the Collegiate Choir will be singing two songs. Uh, my Latin is not so good for the first one, so I apologize. Uh, non Nobis Domine by Roger Quilter and Jesus is Mine by Robert Lau.
Well, happy Sabbath. I'm accustomed to a church that says a little bit more vibrant and, well, anyway, happy Sabbath. <laughs> there we go. Um, if you would have seen me 15 minutes early, where's Jack, our vice president? Well, he's probably still working on that toilet. But anyway, there, there we were, him and I, there trying to get the toilet just about 15 minutes ago working for the ladies. So that's why I was a little bit late, but you know what? It's important, you know what I mean? So anyway, I told them that I was afraid that if we walk in there and a woman comes in, you know, what is she gonna think? And then a woman walks in. So anyway, she says, well, I just wanna look at the mirror and I told her she looks just perfect. Anyway, um, before I pray, I just want you to know this school, I have wonderful memories of this school. In fact, this is where I actually learned about Christ in a much larger picture from the Christ I knew in New York City. And uh, I remember I preached a sermon that was very controversial, and I used an illustration called My Pimple, My Problem, and I was told that for a college church that was a little bit too straightforward. But don't worry, I won't be talking like that today. But, um, but it's been 25 years. Five kids, four boys, and my, my little princess. And I have my 26-year-old wife, and I always tell everyone she's 26 years old. And then they say, I'm a cradle snatcher. And I says, yes, I know, but we've been married for 26 years. And, um, and I remember times were, were very tight financially. And so she graduated in the morning with her, with her degree in nursing. And then that very same afternoon, she got her MRS degree in the afternoon. So we got married in the, in the village church, and then we had our, our uh, reception here, thanks to Henry Livergood. He made an incredible cake. Um, and I'm sorry, but that little piece of cake that Henry told us we have to save for the anniversary at the end of one year, it didn't last that long. It was that good. <laughs> anyway. The title of today's sermon is called Rise Up. And in dispersed with the Bible, I, I will share with you some some wonderful things that I learned here at AUC. Let me pray. Father, once again, as I come before your church on this Holy Sabbath day, use me as your instrument of love and help us to see Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I've been to many parts of the world and one of the things that really astounds me is that in uh, some of the poor countries, they use bamboo for construction, for scaffolding and all these other things. And so I decided to get to know a little bit about this incredible bamboo plant. And one of the things that I discovered is that if you first plant it, you don't see nothing for seven years. The root systems goes down and, and, and it, it, it develops and it builds and, and finally, when the, when the time comes and you don't even know it, you wake up in the morning and there is a shoot two feet tall. And the next day, it's four feet tall. And the next day, is six feet tall. In fact, it grows two feet a day. Now, I was thinking, my goodness, imagine if our children would ever be like that. Have mercy. But, um, but if you have patience, if you have patience, because um, it actually grows an inch an hour, and if you have patience and decide to have your lunch for half an hour and watch it carefully, you will actually see the bamboo grow half an inch. I mean, it's incredible. Well, this evening, we're going to share a story also in the Bible where someone rises up, and I think it's an incredible story. Acts chapter three, if you have your Bibles with you. Acts chapter three, beginning with verse one and two, and the Bible says this. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour, that's three o'clock. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that enter into the temple. Now I'm gonna share something with you out here. You don't see much of that, but living in New York City and other parts and other cities, you see people still begging today. And in those days, unlike today, the church was divided into three parts. You had a section that was called the Court of the Gentiles with a wall close to five feet tall. And then you had another section called the Court of the Women and another one, the Court of the Men. And when you went from the court of the Gentiles to the section that the women went to worship, there was a gate that was about 60 feet wide and tall and beautiful. But on one side there was a placard 
that said if you were a Gentile and you passed this gate in three different languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, you're liable of death. Now, I don't know about you, but coming to church and all of a sudden, if you're a convert and you see this sign there in this corner and it says that if you walk through this gate called beautiful and you pass this gate, you're liable of death. I don't know about you, but what kind of church is that? Unlike the cross that also had an inscription in three languages that said this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, that when you come to Jesus, praise the Lord, we have salvation. But there it was. Three walls of separation. This is where Paul in the book of Romans says that when Christ came, he took down those walls of separation so that now we all have entrance directly to the throne of grace. Praise the Lord for that. I want you to know that even though these walls of all are torn down, there's still walls that exist today. In fact, when I first came to where you see, I, I realized that there were some walls of ignorance and some walls of separation that I didn't even know existed. For instance, um, growing up at the Spanish Mahaven Church, you know, everyone um, that I grew up with was Spanish. We all grew up with a mustache from the moment we were born. You understand that? We all ate rice and beans, and we all looked the same, acted the same, talked the same. And then I come to this wonderful school, and it's a shock. My first shock was my friends from Maine and Vermont had an accent. And, and, I, and, I, and I talked to my bride-to-be, and I asked her, where, you, where do you work? And she says, I work at the firm. I said, well, is that the name of a corporation? Is that a you know, Ford company? She goes, no, I work at the firm. And I said, well, is that like, you know, Ford, Toyota, you know, Xerox company? No, I work at the firm. I said, explain it to me. She says, you know, where there's cows and sheep, all oh, the farm. She goes, yeah, I work at the firm. <laughs> so I learned about that I was not the only one with an accent. You understand what I'm saying? And then I learned that folks from Massachusetts have a spelling deficiency because they told me to get to where you see, you have to go through Worcester. And I said, how do you spell that? They go, W-O-R-C-H-E-S-T, you mean Worcester. And they go, no, Worcester. And I'm saying, is there a problem here in communication? <laughs> and then it says, and, and you make a turn before you get to Limister. And I said, how do you spell that? L-E-O, it says, you mean Leo. And they go, no, Le. So I realized that, again, walls of ignorance existed. And then, when I got to the cafeteria, it was the biggest shock of all. Um, Henry Livergood is an excellent cook, but when I got there, I said, where's the rice and beans? <laughs> anyway, the good thing about this school that I learned is the diversity of how God works with so many different cultures and people and origins. I mean, it's just wonderful to eat and to socialize and to be together. But here in those days, there was a wall of separation. And one of the things I learned about AUC is that these walls of separation did come down. And my roommate was from another country. My sweet mate was from another color. You get the picture. And, and this integration of culture and dynamics took place. And I saw God in a much huge, much greater dynamics. But here's this man, and there he is in a cup jingling, asking alms to be fed. And I'm going to be honest with you, most people that you see in the corner asking for, for food or for drink actually just walk by. Every now and then someone gave the man a piece of fruit, a piece of bread. Some threw actually money into his little jar or tin can that he had there. But most people actually walk right by. And honestly, if I was there, I might have been one of those two that walked right by. But one of the things that I learned in our theology class, now, it's interesting, um, Dean Davis, I always thought that Dean was his title. And I used to call him Dean Title Davis, because in the Spanish culture, you don't call someone by their first name. You understand that? That's a no-no. And, uh, and so I used to call him Dean all the time. And then later on, when I found out that that wasn't his name, 
I mean, the title that was actually his name, I apologized profusely. I go, ah! So anyway, so he said, it's fine, it's fine. But anyway, Dr. Davis used to teach us in our class that everyone needs Jesus. Doesn't matter what they look like, doesn't matter what they smell like, doesn't matter, you get the picture. Everybody needs Jesus. And so after graduating from here, one of the churches that I had, and I was taught to be creative in my sermon presentation and style, I was preaching on Matthew 25, 31 through 46, where it says that if anyone does these to these, they do it to me. You know the text. So I decided to um, try something. And I have a friend, his name is Josh, and I asked him to dress like a bum, just like this guy over here. And at first he said no, because this guy, very clean cut, wears thousand dollar suits, you get the picture. And I said, you're the perfect choice because if you dress like a bum, nobody would ever think it. And he prayed about it, and finally he said, I'll do it. And so he dressed up literally like a bum. He smelled like one, woo, looked like one, he dressed like one. And there he was sitting in the front of the church, just like in this story here. And I asked him to sit by the door, just like in this story here, by the temple. And so what happens, all of us walk into the church, and finally I see him there, and, I, and at first I didn't recognize it because he really didn't look like Josh. And he says, don't blow my cover. So at the end of the, ser at the, end of the service, just before it was time, I was going to call him up. He went back into his car, he changed, went into the bathroom, cleaned up, put on his nice suit, shoes and everything. And I mentioned that we have this gentleman that was sitting right by the front entrance of the church. And I'm going to call him up to interview him. And he's here in church. Well, everyone is looking around. They say, he's not here. He says, Pastor, he ain't here. He says, I'm telling you, he's right here. So I call him to the front and say, that's not him. He's clean cut. He smells right. Hair nice, nice shoes, Gucci. Um, soon you get the picture. And I said, this is him. And then they say, no way, it's not him. I said, the difference is he's clean cut. He looks good. But the other guy was not clean cut. He didn't look good. He smelled. And so he takes a bag and he opens it up and there he puts out the hat, the shirt, the pants, and everyone says, oh my goodness, it is him. Now we begin to interview. So how many people talk to you? Three. 500 member church? Three. How many people invited you in? One. Now I'm going to tell you something. After church, people were very angry with me. They said, Pastor, you embarrassed us. And I said, no, I didn't want to embarrass you. I just wanted us to see the true condition of our hearts, where church actually stood. Because you see, I too would have been probably just like you, would have walked right by and said nothing. But you see, one of the things that I learned at AUC is that everyone needs Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. The following Sabbath... I don't care what bum was out there in front of that church. They were all getting invited to come into the church. And some of them, praise the Lord, became baptized into the church. So here we have this man that most people are ignoring. Most people are walking by. And he's asking for money. And finally, the Bible says, Peter and John are about to go into the temple. Um, he asks alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, says, look on us. Now, I don't know about you, but when, but when you ask you for money and you tell someone to look at us, that means that something good is about to happen. Yes or no? And, and he's thinking, okay, it ain't going to be the penny. It ain't going to be the nickel. It ain't going to be the quarter. It ain't going to be the half a dollar. It's probably going to be a dollar, maybe two dollars. This is the good one. And then he says, expecting to receive something with them, Peter says, silver and gold have I None. I'm going to stop right there. All of a sudden, here's this man. He's expecting to see that jingle come in. Santa Claus, Christmas, you get the picture? And all of, all of a sudden, these two preachers say, well, listen, silver and gold have I none. You talk about a letdown, a setback. He doesn't understand what's about to happen. He's only looking at the temporal situation in his life. But you know what? I couldn't understand what Peter and John went through as preachers, that they don't have money. Because I remember going to AUC, and I'm going to tell you something, silver and gold had I none. I remember when, and we used to be afraid of the glass window 
at the financial office. And there on the other side was Sister Eleanor Knowles. You remember Sister Knowles? And I remember going to, to the glass window for the first time because I was afraid. And, 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 and I had my, my thing done where you know how much money came from scholarships, how much was uh, you know, from this, and how much money was that. But when you looked at the end, there was a huge gap. And I remember going to that window, and she gave me this look, and, and fear came trembling down, I mean, literally. And all I could say to her was, silver and gold have I none. <laughs> but that which I have are these two hands. And then all of a sudden, a smile came on her. <laughs> and right away, she gave me a piece of paper, and she told me where to go, where to get a job, where to do this, where to do that. And because of her, I praise the Lord and other things, I was able to come to AUC. But I remember my graduation day when I finally got to March, and there I was so happy when I received my diploma. And I'm walking down the stairs, and I open it up to look at my diploma, and there was a sheet of paper. Please see financial officer. <laughs> That's how it was. And I remember I started to date this my wife is over here. I'm going to embarrass her. Can you stand up, please, Val? Yes, stand up. There you go. See, she looks just the way she did 26 years ago. I told, I was working, I had so many jobs, and I was working in the grounds this particular year, and I noticed that there was a, a florist that would, would take his flowers and at the dump site would dump it out. And I said, listen, I'm dating this foxy Christian. And they said, what's that? I said, well, she's a Christian on the inside and she's a fox on the outside. I said, that's the best of both worlds. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, but I have a problem, I have no money. And I'm from the old school that you gotta get girls flowers. You know what I'm saying? You gotta get them flowers, but I have no money. And so I talked to the florist, he says, you know, this is what I'm gonna do for you. Because twice a week I went to the, to the location over there to you know, the, dump the stuff out. And he said, I'm going to put flowers, and I'm going to leave it next to the, uh, to the tenant there by his office. You pick them up, you do whatever you want, and you give it to your girlfriend. And so twice a week, I brought flowers to my, to my girlfriend. So much so that the guys in the dormitory used to say, you're making us look bad. And I said, good for you. And he says, where do you get these flowers? I said, nothing. After I got married, I told my wife where I got the flowers. Not before. What was that? They're still beautiful. But here is this man. Here are these preachers. They don't have silver or gold. But they want to share what they learn about Jesus Christ. Now, going back a little bit, here's this man. From the moment he was born, he was a cripple. And this is his life. Every day, they pick him up, and they take him to the temple. And he's asked for money, and every day, he goes back home, and then... The life starts all over again. It goes right back to the church asking for money. But it hit me. If this man was there for all these years, then he saw Jesus at the temple also. He saw Jesus when he turned the tables over. He saw Jesus when the children were running around and the disciples tried to stop the kids and Jesus said, suffer the little children not. He saw Jesus when the children were sleeping on his lap. He saw Jesus when the woman that was caught in adultery was stoned in his presence. And he forgave her. And he said, he did it without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then he says, neither, you, you get the picture. He was there when he says, I am the Lamb of God. He saw Jesus, he heard Jesus. But and then there was another side. Because you see the religious leaders would walk right by and ignore him. Because you see, there was this view of God that existed back then. That if you were lame, deaf, dumb, crippled, mentally challenged, it was because your parents sinned. And then they tried to cover it up. And now that sin is exposed by you in reality. So in other words, the reason why you're lame, dumb, crippled is because your parents were sinners. Now you are the symbolism of your parents' sin. I don't know about you, but imagine if that's how people looked at you, that you were the result of your parents' sin. 
I want you to know that when I came to this school, people also had interesting views of God. Some looked at God as tyrannical because they had a bad role model. Some people looked at God as works-oriented. They had to work their way to heaven. Others felt that they were never good enough, and they were never good enough, only through Christ Jesus. But I want you to know something, that because of this school, I've seen people literally change their view of God to the Christ that's in the Bible, to the Christ that is loving and caring and forgiving and long-suffering. And he was also our friend, our Lord and our Savior. And I've seen people that had this terrible view of God, and when they find the true God of the Bible, become transformed and begin to celebrate the joy of what it means to be in Christ Jesus. But see, this man lost hope. And I want you to know that being a pastor now these 25 years, I've seen people that have lost hope also. Many people drink today because they're in such pain that they want to drown their pain away. But when the alcoholism is over, their problems are still there. I've seen people take drugs because they want to rise above what's the ailment that they're going through, but when the high is over, they still hit that low. I've seen people in poor relationships looking for love in all the wrong places, and they want to find love, but they don't know how to find the love of Jesus Christ. And many times these people look for short-term solutions, and, and some people, they pay money to try to purchase a solution for their problems, but you know what? It doesn't matter how much silver and gold you have. It doesn't matter how much money you try to throw away at these problems, because the only way that we can truly have success is through Christ and Christ alone. He is the only solution that this world has. And so this man is looking for a fix for his problems, but he's about to meet someone, praise the Lord, that's going to permanently change his life. And so the Bible says, Peter and gold have I none, but such that I have, I give to you. Now here's the thing here. He says, that which I have, I give. But here's the problem. If you don't have it, you can't give it. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you can't share it. If Christ hasn't transformed you and changed you and made you a new creation, how can you share it? One of the things that I learned here at AUC, I want you to know, is the transforming power of Jesus Christ. I've seen freshmen and sophomores and juniors and seniors and super seniors go through this school and some of them were the most callous and rough-edged and hard, but I want you to know that when they met Jesus Christ, they became transformed. And they became a living witness of what true Christianity is all about. And so it says, that which I have I give you. And then he says, I love this, in the name of Jesus Christ, he says, rise up and walk. But there's a problem. The man never walked in his life. And so I could see him struggling, trying to, to listen to the command. <clears throat> and in verse 7, the Bible says, and he took him by the right hand, and he lifts him up. Now, before I go on, <clears throat> in those days, you don't touch these people. In those days, you can look, you can give, but you don't touch. But praise the Lord that our Jesus is not like that. Praise the Lord that our Jesus is willing to get his hands dirty for the sake of bringing people to Jesus Christ. I remember when I was, at, I was at a Christian convention in Florida, and there was an individual there that was working for a community service program and was sharing with us how all these people come through the services there. And all of a sudden, the gloves come out, you know, the, the medical gloves, you know, the, the, those plastic things, you know how they do that, they roll it up and they put it on. And then all of a sudden the, the bag opens up and the pliers come out and she's talking about this shoe of this person that came in and this, 
This was a shoe, and look at the condition. And she put it back in, and she sealed it. She took the gloves off and everything. And I'm thinking, my goodness, did you hug the person? Do you touch the person? Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we're afraid to get our hands dirty. But praise the Lord, that's not the Jesus that I serve. And the Bible says that he picked them up by the hands, and then immediately, immediately, his feet and his ankle bones received strength. Now, I know a little bit about, at, um, what is it, atrophy, honey? Is that what you call it? When you don't move your legs, you actually begin to lose muscle mass and those things. Those in the medical profession, you know what I'm talking about. And so I was imagining, imagine this scene. He lifts him up and all of a sudden his leg that was skinny swells up, you know? And the bottom portion swells up. And all of a sudden he, can, he feels his toes. And he feels his skin come to life. And then you hear like a snap, crackle, pop as he straightened one leg out. And all of a sudden his right leg swells up also again. Sorry if I get sound effect, you know. And the other one swells up again, all of a sudden he, he feels his toes, and then he moves and then snap, crackle, pop, and, and now he's standing up, and all of a sudden he can walk. And the Bible says this here, that he begins to leap, and he begins to walk, and he begins to praise God. And you know what, I'm not, I'm not Pentecostal, but I'll tell you one thing, if this guy came to this church and all of a sudden he gets healed and he's jumping up and, and running all over the place, we say, praise the Lord. And all of a sudden, he's praising God and shouting. And this is what I love here. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And in fact, and they went to church together. We live in a world today. And people need to hear about Jesus. I have seen people in pain and sorrow. But when they came to Jesus, they were lifted and then they rose up out of those problems. I've seen young men in evangelistic series who had drug problems and alcoholic problems. And they could not beat that drug and that alcohol. And finally I said, have you tried Jesus Christ? And they tried Jesus Christ and I said, forget about the five-step method, the ten-step method, the twenty-step method. I'm going to introduce you to the one-step method. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And by the end of the crusade, praise the Lord, completely drug-free. I've seen people with marital problems who, where their counselor said, it's beyond repair, get a divorce. And I've asked them, have you tried Jesus? And all of a sudden, those marriages change and they become whole again. I'm going to share something with you. It was my senior year. I was getting, we are getting ready to graduate. I got a call to work in the Greater New York Conference. And we had financial problems. And there I am, a pastor to be. And everything I'm sharing with you is all these things that I learned here that you see about trust in Jesus. Follow Jesus. Have faith in Jesus. He will always guide you through. There might be pain, there might be struggles, but in the end, he will always guide you through. But there we were. I opened up the refrigerator, and it was air. We opened up the cupboards, and it was air. Except for that one roach that walked by. And then I opened the top cover, and there was one can of SpaghettiOs. And it wasn't large, it was a regular size. And I looked at my wife, we were married, and he says, you know what? We have to make a choice. Pay our tithe or buy our food. None of you have ever gone through those situations. And everything I learned at AUC is trust in God, have faith in Jesus, he will guide you through. And here I am, a senior, getting ready to graduate, financially tight, and there I'm put in a situation that now, forget about what you learn in class, now you have to put your faith in Jesus and make a decision. And so my wife popped the can open, and we opened it up, and there, one spaghetti for you, one spaghetti for me, 
one spaghetti for you, one spaghetti for me. And then in the end, she said, well, since you weigh a little bit more than I do, you get the extra spaghetti -o. It was like 51 and 50, whatever it was. <clears throat> and I remember eating that spaghetti -o and thinking, man, I wish I had bread. And we said, Lord, being a Christian is hard. Giving your life to Jesus is not easy. Here we are at AUC and we're learning about him and, and now we have to walk that faith that we all talked about. And we made a decision to pay our tithe. And I remember I started to cry and I walked out that door and as I walked out the door I said, Lord, I'm, not, I'm, I'm upset but I'm not angry. I'm Spanish, okay? <laughs> I'm upset, but I'm not angry. I say, but you asked me, and I have to walk by faith. And as I was walking out the door, I almost tripped over these bags of groceries that are outside the door. To this day, we don't even know how those bags got there. But I remember taking those bags inside, and tears just coming out of our eyes. And everything that was in the bag we ate was the stuff that we ate. You know, some people give you stuff and you don't eat it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But everything in the bags was exactly what we ate. I'm very grateful to you, see. I'm grateful for what it's taught me. And in fact, part of me is like this man that was by the steps. And part of me is like Peter and John. I see myself in both of these characters here. And I want to share this with you tonight before I close. We worship a wonderful Jesus. And I want you to know that the lessons that I learned in this school have faith and trust in Jesus, have faith and trust in Jesus. And I want you to know that whatever problems you have, whatever ailments might be, whatever circumstances might be, whatever situation might be, that when you walk with Christ and you have faith with him, he will help you through. And you will rise up just like this man. He rose up physically, but praise the Lord, will raise up spiritually. And just like this man came praising the Lord and thanking God for the miracle of his life, we too will rise up. And praise the Lord and thank him for the wonderful things that he's done in our life. Have faith in Jesus. I'm going to have a word of prayer, then we sing our closing song. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for AUC. Thank you so much, Lord, for helping me discover Christ in such a wonderful way here. Thank you, Lord, because I've discovered you, how you work through cultures and languages and peoples and customs and times. Thank you, Father, because you're so dynamic and so wonderful that you're patient with us and you're willing to work with us. And Lord, even when we fail, you're still there to lift us up and give us another chance. Thank you so much, Lord, that you love us. Continue to bless this wonderful school, Father. I do now ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our closing song. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the fifth stanza. Take my life and let it be hymn number 330. Valerie. Let us stand.
Our Heavenly Father, we have certainly been blessed by being here this evening. Thank you so much for the inspirational message presented by Pastor Rodriguez. How blessed he was as a student, how blessed so many of us were when we were students here at AUC. We're thankful for the dedicated teachers and fellow students that helped mold our lives. Help us to be faithful and service for thee. Help our witness to be that which will lead others to a knowledge of you. May we have a blessed evening and return for worship thee in the morning. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. very much. <clears throat> we continue our program downstairs. Sticky buns. All are invited to go down and if we have a lot of sticky buns you can take them home for midnight snack and breakfast tomorrow. Please downstairs at the fellowship hall for sticky buns. Thank you.